some people kind of live in a perpetual parasympathetic state, just like there's people that live in a chronically stressed out state. There's people that live in a perpetually relaxed state too. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 168. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Dr. Sachin Patel. He's a father, husband, philanthropist, coach, and international speaker. He founded the Living Proof Institute as part of his own personal transformation, and his philosophy is that the doctor of the future is the patient. He's actively doing whatever it takes to keep people out of the medical system by empowering them through education, self-care, and remapping their mindset. I have to say, Dr. Sachin is a very intelligent man, and we are so lucky to not only have had him on the podcast, but that he's also local. He's not too far away from us. He is in Ontario. So super amazing, but he also reaches people worldwide, and we had such a great conversation, guys. So excited for you to listen to this. Some of the highlights from our conversation are that you don't need protein, you need amino acids, the three things school didn't teach us, the quickest way to feel better is to change what you're thinking about, how miscommunication is a big source of stress, if you feel terrible when you wake up, your sleep probably sucked. So now let's get into things with Dr. Sachin Patel. Hi, Sachin. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me. So great to have you on the show, Sachin. And I can really relate to at least the early on part of your story where you're a chiropractor, you're working with athletes, you're doing a lot of soft tissue work. I think it was actually ART, which when I was in practice, that was a big part of what I was doing. But since then, you've had such a transition and things have come such a long way. And now you founded the Living Proof Institute. So let's take things back and start at the beginning of that story and share with the listeners how things have progressed over the years. Sure. So the thing that changed my life, I graduated from chiropractic school, New York Chiropractic College, specifically in 2004. I thought I found my dream job. I was working in a sports clinic in Cincinnati, Ohio, one of the top clinics in the state, and doing ART, working with elite athletes, Olympic athletes, marathon runners. You know, people would come to me from all over the world to get help. And I was an associate for a practitioner. And she was fantastic. She was an amazing inspiration to me. And I thought I found my dream job. In 2006, she was actually asked to be on the news, being the owner of the clinic. She passed it on to me instead and said, you know, Sachin, why don't you do this? And I jumped all over it. You know, I was a couple of years into practice. So this was my ticket to, you know, exploding the practice and, and serving more people and, you know, having a bigger impact. So I jumped all over it. And the story that they did was about elbow pain. So we were helping people with ART doing, you know, soft tissue work on them, for those of you that don't know, and getting rid of their chronic elbow issues, despite them having surgeries and physiotherapy and things like that, that had failed in the past. The story aired, I remember it was on the five o'clock news. So around 520 it aired and the phone just wouldn't stop ringing that evening. And all these people just kept calling and calling and calling. So here I am excited. And then as these people started coming in, I wasn't so excited anymore because I didn't know how to help them. So we went from having elite athletes coming to see us in our waiting room then that transitioned into really, really chronically unwell people and of no fault of their own because they had tried everything to their knowledge to get well. And for some reason, they saw that news report and found hope. Or what I probably realized in hindsight is they were just desperate and looking for answers. And something that they saw in that news report you know, influenced them to call our office. Out of all the people that called, only one person had actually had elbow pain, and it was because she had rheumatoid arthritis. Like no athletes called. Athletes, I guess, were out for a run during that period of time. And everyone else who was really sick was at home at that time. So as these people started pouring in, you know, I really didn't know what to do with them. And, you know, I'm a pretty high integrity guy in the sense that I don't like wasting people's time or money. So I didn't even promise them that I could help them. I just didn't know what to do with them. I didn't even know where to send them. That was the gut wrenching part. You know, it's you can't help everybody. You kind of realize that as you mature as a clinician. But when you don't know where to send them, And you've just got to send them home to continue to suffer, essentially. My wife, uh, Deepa, now at the time was a pharmacist and working as a pharmacist. So I would consult with her and be like, you know what, these people are coming in, all these medications, what can I do for them? And, you know, her training didn't really provide an exit strategy for people on medications. They just, you know, learned about the medications and the interactions, but not how to get people off the medications. So, you know, she was really not of much help. And then, I kind of gave up. I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do with these people. I'm just going to tell them. I'm just going to be honest with them. And so what I realized is that, you know, I encountered this huge 
barrier and I realized that there's all these people out there, millions upon millions of people uh, that are suffering. And the barrier that I had was, you know, not knowing what to do and not even knowing where to turn. But then what happened was I started getting case studies from a clinician. His name is Dr. Ron Grisanti, and he would later become my mentor. And so his case studies that he was presenting were very similar to the clients that I was seeing in my office. And right around that time, he was offering a course, and I was part of the first graduating class. I took the course, not knowing what would come of it. And I actually took it partly for myself, too, because I was having my own fatigue and and digestive issues. And as I was interviewing some of these chronically ill patients, like that's where a lot of their problems started was with digestive issues and fatigue. That's how it started. And then it, you know, snowballed into something more significant. So I'm like, man, if I ever get to that point, then there's really nothing that medicine can do to help me. So I need to find out what's going on now with myself, not necessarily thinking about changing careers or changing paths, but, you know, just wanting to help myself and, you know, kind of feeling that there's more that I could do for people and signed up for the course and I downloaded the intake form. And I instantly started giving it to all my chiropractic patients. After I started giving it to them, I realized when I got the forms back that many of them were dealing with chronic health issues that they never brought to my attention before because they didn't even connect the two. They didn't connect their neck pain, you know, perhaps to their digestive issues and not to say that they're connected, even though they probably are into some variants, but more so they didn't even know that I could help them. So they wouldn't even bring it up to my attention. What I realized at that point is that I was already sitting on an active practice right? I already had people that I could help using functional medicine, people that knew, like, and trusted me with other areas of their health. And so I took the course. I started applying a lot of teachings to myself and it changed my life. My fatigue went away. I discovered I had a major gluten intolerance. I also discovered that I had yeast overgrowth. And I was like, man, this explains a lot. And I can only imagine how many other people have these things because, you know, relative to most people, I was taking better care of myself. And so I really started by giving my patients the questionnaires and the rest is history. Once I learned about how sick people were, no matter how they presented physically, and a lot of people had silent and invisible illnesses that they weren't telling anyone about because they just given up and learned to live with them. That was when the idea of branching off into functional medicine really birthed. I was being groomed actually to take over the clinic that I was working for. So it was a tough decision when I had to turn down that offer and go in a completely different direction. But since then, I really haven't looked back and It's been transformative for me. It's been transformative in the application with my family and then, of course, my patients as well. What would you say was the most common thread amongst all these people and their intake forms coming back? Like, what was the number one thing? Uh, Digestive issues. Okay, interesting. So, what was some of the starting points for a lot of people with that? Like, that's such a big one, right? You know, the digestion going from. Yeah, the upper body to the lower body. And, you know, people don't even know that it's not just about what you're eating. It's all these other things that are impacting their life. Yeah. So when somebody comes in into our office, we don't just pay attention to what they're eating because typically at this point, with all the information out there, most people, despite what they might think, if you're making a concerted effort, you're probably eating relatively healthy. There might be some nuances, but you know, most people who are seeking this type of care have usually tried various diets at this point. What we find is often overlooked is uh, blind spots that these people have and and blind spots in the sense that they wouldn't even know to look for these things. And what we find that a lot of people have are stealth infections. And these are infections that kind of go below the radar. Uh, Sometimes we can pick them up from sexual partners. Sometimes we can pick them up from our pets. We can pick them up on vacation. You know, we can pick them up by sharing utensils with some people. So these are things that are significant because they create a chronic state of inflammation and a heightened immune state in the body. And the ripple effect of that chronic inflammation and chronic stress and dysfunction of the immune system is what leads to most chronic illnesses. And this is why you're seeing such a rise in autoimmunity because the majority of our immune system is actually in our digestive tract. So it's a combination of not just what's going in there, but also what went down there because Your gut microbiome is a reflection of not just what you're eating now, but what you've eaten in the past, the variety and variance of your diet. Some people kind of eat the same things over and over again, so they feed the same microbes over and over again. And then the other thing that we see quite often is not just what people eat can be a problem, but how they eat can be a problem. And this is where we discuss with patients, you know, more specifically, what are not just what you're eating, but how are you eating? Are you chewing your food? Are you relaxed? Are you stressed out? Are you, a lot of moms are, you know, grabbing a bite as they're feeding their children and they're just running around 
uh, without actually being conscious and being mindful of what they're eating, despite the fact that they're eating healthy, even unhealthy food, if it's undigested, creates problems in the body. Let's dig into that a little bit deeper, because oftentimes on the show, we're talking about what to eat, different diets. And I think by now, our listeners have a pretty good idea of a lot of places that they can at least experiment when it comes to diet. But how to eat is a whole nother beast. And you've kind of touched on it quickly there. But let's dig into this in a little bit more depth and talk about, say, somebody sitting down or even before they go and sit down and have the meal. What are some things to consider for optimal digestion? Sure. So the principles that we use are choose. So you got to choose the right foods that are right for your goals, your goals, right? So sometimes people will eat what their personal trainer is eating. And that person might have completely different body composition goals. They might have completely different physical goals, like what they actually want to do with their body. They might have completely different goals with how they spend their time, right? First, we have to align our nutritional plan, whatever that might be, whether it's vegan, vegetarian, you know, ketogenic, you know, but the main thing is, is whatever we're eating, it has to digest. So when somebody's chronically ill, generally we tend to find that really dense foods create problems for them. So if somebody has poor health, it's almost guaranteed they have poor digestion because everything's connected. So you can't have like, you know, great digestive function and poor health. The two are incompatible with each other. So if there's a decreased digestive function, then we want to give people foods that are easy for them to digest. And so some things that are easy to digest are plant foods, proteins, whether they come from plants or animals can be very dense in terms of how much energy is required to digest them, right? It takes a lot of energy to digest protein because it takes a lot of energy to make stomach acid. Your stomach acid is a million times more acidic than your blood. So the production of stomach acid requires immense amounts of metabolic energy. And so if somebody's got low systemic energy at a conscious level, guess what? Their stomach acid production is probably low as well. When somebody says, I need protein in my diet, you actually don't need protein. What you need is amino acids. So what your body does with protein is it breaks it down through a chemical process, and it breaks these proteins down into individual amino acids. And then the amino acids are absorbed into the bloodstream and then reformulated into proteins again. When we consume proteins and they don't digest properly because perhaps we're making inadequate amounts of stomach acid, what you end up with is undigested proteins which then later putrefy in the digestive system. So a sign, a physical sign of protein putrefaction is a stool with a strong odor. Your stool should be relatively odorless because there shouldn't be rancid fats and putrefying proteins in there. You know, when spinach goes bad, it doesn't have a smell, right? When uh, kale goes bad, it doesn't have a strong odor to it. When an apple goes bad, it doesn't have a strong smell to it. So plant foods don't produce this putrefying and rancidifying effect, if you know what I mean. And so when we're not digesting our fats and proteins properly, our bowel movements will have a stronger odor. So that's one of the quick ways for people to tell if they have strong, healthy digestion. The other thing with proteins is that the immune system can only react to a protein, which means that an amino acid cannot initiate an immune response. So if amino acids get into the bloodstream, which they should, there's no immune reaction or autoimmune reaction taking place. But if an undigested protein from, let's say, eggs or you know whatever that food might be, nuts or seeds, gets into the bloodstream, then that creates more of a problem for people. And the immune system is designed to respond to foreign proteins. And then this creates this corresponding systemic immune response that takes place. And that's where a lot of autoimmunity actually starts. So, you know, for so many people who are dealing with autoimmune issues, which is, as you said, very common these days, is it enough to just find certain supplements? You know, what's the best approach? Is it elimination diets? I know it's going to be so individual, but someone who's listening to this and feeling like, oh my gosh, that's me. What's a good starting point for them to start to address this differently? And I'm guessing I know chewing the food is really important because you need to break it down small enough to get into the body. But is there any other supplementary things that could, could aid with this? You know, the best thing to start your health journey is to really understand what is the end game. The end game isn't that people want better digestion. What the end game is, is they want better health. So what is the key controlling and contributing factor to your health is your happiness. So first and foremost, we have to find out what makes people happy because what makes them happy will make them healthy. What makes people unhappy is what makes them sick. So happiness is the ultimate goal when it comes to living a meaningful life, when it comes to living a long life. And happiness is one of the main things that's missing, especially in people who have chronic illness. 
So not to say that unhappiness caused it because it could be a stealth infection that caused it that they picked up in Cuba. But a lot of people we find aren't doing things on a daily basis that make them happy. So the key with autoimmunity is that yes, the body creates antibodies, but the way the body signals antibodies is through what are called cytokines. Cytokines are essentially messengers of inflammation. So imagine you're at a party and there's 50 bouncers at the party. Usually that's not a problem. They're just kind of making sure everything's under control. But if you signal those bouncers to attack somebody or to confine a situation, then they're all going to jump all over it. And so cytokines are essentially that signal. If we think about an immune system reaction, we want that in certain instances, right? If there's a virus or a bug in there, we want the immune system to respond. But if somebody has chronic stress levels, if somebody has chronic inflammation, if somebody has emotional trauma that's playing a role in their life, somebody has toxic relationships, somebody feels underappreciated at work, or they feel undermined, that raises cytokines. And when you raise cytokines, now the bouncers are on high alert and they start attacking anything that's been tagged uh, by the antibodies. And so the things that lower cytokine activity are gonna be things that make us happy. So laughing, lower cytokines, getting a massage, lower cytokines, hanging out with your friends, lower cytokines, you know, doing things like volunteering, lower cytokines. So everything that enhances the human experience, lower cytokines. And anything that moves us away from the human experience raises cytokines. I want to talk about chronic stress. And I want to start out by sharing a story that I heard you talk about on another show where when you were in practice, I'm not sure what practice this was, but you got to a point where you were actually owed $60,000 and the practice couldn't pay you. So you ended up walking away. And I'm sure this caused all kinds of stress for you at the time. Where were you in your practice career? And let's talk about what kind of impact this had on you at the time. Sure, absolutely. Great question. So one of the things that happened to me after I left that original associateship that I was part of, a friend and I partnered up and we were going to go into business together and start our own clinic using functional medicine. So him and I were roommates and we were both taking the course together and we're like, wow, dude, we got to really run with this because nobody's doing this and there's a lot of people suffering and struggling. And so we found kind of what we thought was our unique selling proposition, if you will, and our unique, you know, take on getting people healthy. And so we were approached by another company uh, who already had existing practices set up inside of a gym. And I won't say their name, but they basically saw the potential in us and they gave us the opportunity to not only provide chiropractic care in a gym, but also do functional medicine and incorporate it. So it was a win-win for us. We hadn't, neither one of us had owned our own practice. And this was kind of like owning your own practice and not being micromanaged and having autonomy and freedom to do good work. So we jumped all over it. And in a short period of time, we became very successful. And, you know, the gym audience is very receptive to health and wellness and uh, vitality. So our practices took off. And within three months, we were basically handed over three clinics by this company. And my partner and I were able to handle the load and continue to grow them and scale them. But the company was growing so fast because they were expanding as quickly as the gyms were expanding that they just didn't hire the right talent. And so because of that, their practices were bleeding money. And our practices were the top two performing clinics in their company. So they were basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. And, you know, I realized in hindsight that it wasn't intentional. They weren't doing it to be bad people. They were just growing too fast. So through this entire experience, you know, initially it was frustrating. I understood their intention. It wasn't to be malicious in any way. I asked myself, what can I learn from this? And I, what I learned from this whole process is basically how not to put myself in that position. And it gave me the opportunity to kind of step away from what I was doing and start a whole new business under my own terms and with my own vision instead of somebody else's vision for me. And that's when I stumbled across what's known as a smart office. And a smart office is fantastic for functional medicine practitioners because we don't need any fancy equipment. We don't need any fancy chairs or tables or you know anything like that. And all of our testing is basically outsourced to labs. All we needed was a desk to consult patients with. And this allowed me to operate very, very autonomously with an extremely low, very smart overhead. With $1,000 a month, I had a front desk person answering the phone for me and the other businesses that were there. I had a beautiful office that was fully furnished and I had all the amenities. I needed a, a huge size kitchen where I could teach my patients. And I also had a boardroom where I could hold workshops and seminars. So it was like the most perfect scenario, kind of a hidden secret. Like most people would never think to start a practice 
in a space like that, but accountants and lawyers do it all the time. And because we're essentially consultants, it was perfect for us. So we started practicing out of an office in Westchester, Ohio. And then my wife and I knew that we were going to eventually move back to Toronto. So we had planned kind of our exit strategy. We brought on a clinician that uh, Dr. Siegler, who works there now and who runs the office there now. And we moved to Toronto and started a very similar type of office in a smart office location again in Mississauga. And we've got, you know, four practitioners here in Toronto. We've got a couple down in, in Cincinnati. We've got a hypnotherapist on staff. We've got a healthy home specialist on staff. We have health coaches on staff. So we've got an amazing team of people that now, you know, serve our clients all over the world. Well, it sounds like you definitely took a very stressful situation and made the best of it and turned it into this beautiful practice that you're now part of. But let's talk about stress and the average person that's coming in to see you guys and what kind of stress is the average North American person under these days? You know, the average North American is under tremendous amounts of stress in the areas that we learn nothing about in school. So let me explain. In school, we don't learn three things. You know, in our 18 years plus that we spend in school, we don't talk about personal finances, we don't talk about personal health, and we don't talk about food in an intelligent, meaningful way. So all of these things are paid lip service. So it's no wonder that the most lucrative industries on the planet are the financial industry, the agricultural industry, and also the healthcare industry, right? So people don't know how to balance a checkbook. They don't know how to manage money. Not everyone, but a lot of people that we see, and they may not necessarily know how to manage their health, and they certainly aren't growing their own food, right? So these are the things that we delegate away to other people who may not necessarily always have our best interests in mind. So that's where a lot of our stress comes from. Uh, a lot of people work at a job that they're not thrilled about, that they don't find purpose in, that they feel that they're not contributing enough to society in a positive way. And you know, a lot of people put themselves in financial predicaments. They buy homes more than they can afford, or they buy cars that are more than they can afford. So they put themselves into this perpetual material debt, which creates this overhanging financial stress. And that's not something that goes away very easily, right? If a dog's chasing you, that's gonna last like 30 seconds. But if the bank is chasing you, that's gonna last you know, 30 years if it has to. So that's an area that we see a lot of people stressed out in. There's a lot of confusion that people have around nutrition and a lot of our foods are stressful and inflammatory on our bodies. If people are eating foods that are sprayed with all kinds of chemicals, then that can be a problem as well. So I think a lot of stress comes from confusion, a lack of awareness and delegating the most important assets that we have to other people. We're going to take a quick break from the show with Sachin to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Sun Warrior. And today I want to talk about the Soul Good Protein Bars. These come in handy when you're in a pinch between meals, that hunger hits. I know for me, they're great to have in my backpack, in my desk drawer. I've even been known to have two at a time. They just hit the spot. They're gluten free. They are vegan. Just such a fantastic punch of protein in the middle of the day when you need it. Also, Sun Warrior has a brand new series called The Vegan Vigilante featuring Jason Robel, who was on our show back on episodes 11 and 90. And what he's doing is he is showing people how to make plant-based eating really easy, really fun, and going into obscure places like 7-Eleven and putting together a meal. Kind of random, really fun because he's fun and funny. So make sure that you catch that over on the Sun Warrior website. To take advantage of the amazing lineup of Sun Warrior products, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off. If you spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. What a great deal. The products are awesome. Again, it's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And we're also going to give a shout out to our other show sponsor, Core Chair. So Dr. Sachin talks highly about doing less is actually more. And what's so incredible about the core chair is that you are doing less. You are sitting on a chair during the day, but you are getting these isolated micro movements that are benefiting your body in ways that you won't even understand. You're just going to start to feel better. Your core is going to be more engaged. Your lower back pain, if you have any, is going to totally disappear and you're going to be more focused every day. So less is more and you can do that with active sitting on the core chair. The great thing about these chairs, too, if you decide to order one, is you have 60 days to try it. You get a money-back guarantee if you don't like it. We know you will, though. It's just there for a little security, peace of mind. And as a listener of our show, you get a special deal on your core chair. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair to find out what that is. And if you buy in North America, you get free shipping. 
Again, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Find out what the deal is. Take advantage. These chairs are amazing. Go and order one right now. And now back to our interview with Sachin. And let's talk about the impact of stress specifically on the vagus nerve. This is an area I don't think often gets talked about, and it's just so important to bring up. And I know you're somebody who's well educated on this, and I just love to hear your stance. What happens when we're under chronic stress to that vagus nerve? Well, the vagus nerve stays intact. It's always there. It's always there to serve us like it has been our entire life, which means it's always accessible to us. And so the vagus nerve's responsibility is to help initiate a vagal response, which creates a parasympathetic response in the central nervous system. So one thing I always remind people is that the same blood goes everywhere. And so when we're under stress, we create a systemic stress response because every organ in your body changes its function when it's under stress. For example, if a lion was chasing us, a real lion was chasing us, or even if our boss was like yelling at us or we had a crazy deadline to meet or something you know bad happened, where we send blood is going to determine where we send function. Blood is not going to go to our prefrontal cortex, which is our intelligent human part of our brain. It's going to go to the reptilian brain. So we start thinking very reflexively instead of very deeply or responsively. The next thing that happens is we basically shut off our thyroid because the thyroid is too slow to produce a metabolism that keeps up with the fast pace of a stressful situation. So we shut off the thyroid, but we upregulate adrenal hormones. Now, if you were being chased by a lion or if your boss is yelling at you, the biological response is essentially the same. So what ends up happening is the adrenals get upregulated, thyroid gets downregulated, the adrenals produce a catecholamines, which create the fight or flight response. It also produces cortisol. And cortisol's main job in our physiology is to actually increase blood sugar. So we have a corresponding increase in blood sugar to fuel this response so that we can run away from the lion or fight our boss if we need to. The kidneys shut down because making urine right now is not important, and the kidneys require about 20 to 30 percent of your daily energy expenditure. We're going to conserve energy in non-essential tasks, and we're going to expend energy where, where we actually need it to increase our chances of survival. We then take blood away from the digestive system because you know your stomach's not going to save you from the lion, and we send that same blood to the arms and legs. We can't make more blood, so we have to take it from somewhere and send it elsewhere. And so we send it to our arms and legs. So now the bowel becomes ischemic, the liver becomes ischemic. So all the organs in the viscera are not getting the blood flow that they were used to getting when we were in a non-stressful situation. Reproductive organ function shuts down. If your bladder was full, you'd probably pee your pants. That's what happens to young children or that's what happens even to adults in extremely stressful situations because having a liter of urine in your bladder is not gonna save your life either. The immune system shuts down, so now we downregulate white blood cell function because the white blood cell is not going to save you. So this is why chronic stress depletes uh, regular immune function. You know, basically anything that's necessary for survival gets kicked up. Anything that's non-essential for survival basically shuts down. And so essentially we set the stage when people are under chronic stress, we set the stage for cancer, for diabetes, for heart disease, for neurological dysfunction, for digestive issues, for high blood pressure. I mean, these are all part of the normal stress response. So when somebody comes in and they tell me about all these problems that they have and they're listing off, you know, their high blood pressure, their chronic digestive issues, their high cholesterol, I'm like, you know what? Your body's working perfectly fine. The problem is you're sending it the wrong message. So I expect your blood pressure to be high if your stress levels are high. That's not your body doing something stupid. And I know, Jesse, uh, you and I certainly, and I'm sure Marnie as well, we believe the body's intelligent. And so The moment we assume the body's doing something wrong is the moment we assume it's not intelligent. And so we have to restore that faith in their body with our patients. And I just want to backtrack, just going to the very top. The stress response is actually based on perception. If we go all the way to what happened before this response actually took place, all of our sensory input goes into a part of our brain called the amygdala. So smell, sight, all these things go into this part of the brain, part of our old brain, if you will, our reptilian brain, and it determines, is this a stressful situation or not? So based on our past experiences and based on our subconscious programming, the body creates a response immediately, and it creates either a stress response or a non-stress response, if you will, or everything just stays the same. We stay neutral. That stress response happens before we're even consciously aware that the stress response is happening. So sometimes people will have subconscious stressors that are constantly triggering this perpetual stress response in their body, and they may not even understand why. 
So a lot of times with our patients, we'll go a little bit deeper and we'll look at their subconscious mind through hypnosis and other modalities so that we can see what their operating system is because it's the operating system that essentially creates the stress response. And this is why you can have two people in the exact same scenario, but based on their upbringing and subconscious programming, they're going to have completely different responses. Well, it's interesting that you bring this up because this relates to Bruce Lipton's work. And I know you're a fan of him and we definitely are. We had him on the show And this reprogramming that I think we all need to some degree, it's so important. I don't think we realize how much of our subconscious is ruling us. And thank you for addressing this and what you just described. But being able to go back and do that deep work, of course, it's just a piece of the puzzle, but you've really found that this has been really life-changing for a lot of people and it's just started this cascade of rebuilding health. Yeah, absolutely. And just to kind of go back to the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is governed by the vagus nerve. And so the vagus nerve does the exact opposite. And so we can mechanically stimulate the vagus nerve to create a stress response. And this is why, you know, things like singing, chanting, humming, talking to our friends about our problems mechanically stimulates that nerve to create a relaxation response, if you will. And this is also why a lot of people who work in offices who are just typing away on their on their computers who don't talk to other people, they get very little stimulation of their vagus nerve because they can't chant and sing and do all those things in the office. So they're essentially getting no stimulation of their vagus nerve. The vagus nerve does the exact opposite of the stress response I just mentioned. So it increases immune function or balances immune function. We don't want an imbalanced immune system. So we get a balanced immune system, we get proper kidney function, we get blood flowing to the digestive system so we could digest the food that we just ate. We also get better blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. So now our thinking, creativity, clarity, all of those things improve as well. Our blood pressure decreases, our heart rate decreases, our blood sugar decreases, our catecholamines decrease. So now we can relax or go to bed if we need to. So all of the things that we want to be functioning when healing is taking place are stimulated by the vagus nerve. It's amazing how stimulating one nerve can have such a deep impact on every cell in the body essentially, because remember the same blood goes everywhere. So I can't send a specific signal to just one part of the body, although certain parts of the body have specific receptors and that's how the body controls for that but there's a systemic response that takes place. So we get relaxation in every organ and healing in every organ in our body because there'll never be a scenario where one organ is healing under a certain circumstance and the other one is being destroyed, right? The way the body works intelligently is if one thing's healing, everything's healing. If one thing is dying, everything else is dying at a different pace. What we found is that even if you're meditating, you know, you might be meditating for half an hour a day, but what's happening the rest of the day? right? That subconscious is still there. For some people, they have a hard time meditating because the subconscious needs to be reprogrammed. And the things that they don't want to think about keep coming up in their life or keep coming up in their meditation or their thoughts. So it's hard for them to quiet their mind. People don't complain when they're meditating that I can't keep my mind from thinking of positive things. Usually they can't keep their mind of thinking of negative things, right? The stressors that are going on in their life. And a lot of that comes from perception. So digging into the subconscious a little more here, how does somebody go about assessing in a simple way where they're at with their subconscious and what are some different tools we can use to start reprogramming that in a positive way? Yeah, great question. So a lot of this can be what we call unconscious incompetence. So the person might not even know that they have a problem. But, you know, like Marty said, we probably all need some work there. So for somebody who's struggling or challenged with their health, or even somebody who's relatively healthy, like you guys, who wants to take things to the next level, we're always our worst enemy, whether it's getting sick or whether it's making amazing strides in progress, right? We always have limiting beliefs, and these limiting beliefs are usually subconsciously programmed. So I like going here with any type of client that I work with, whether they're perfectly healthy uh, for most regards or whether they have chronic illness, because what we do or this process doesn't just help unwell people get well, it helps everyone take wherever their health is to the next level. And so we like to explore that with all of our clients as long as they're receptive and open to it. And what we found is that a way that they can start monitoring this is through something called heart rate variability. So we use something called HeartMath, which is a Bluetooth device. They just came out with a new one. So now you can use it with Android. If you have the old one, it plugs right into your iPhone or you can get a handheld device. And this measures your heart rate variability. So let's say your heart rate is 80 beats per minute. Well, in between each of those 80 beats, there's a slight variability. And so what HRV measures is it measures the amount of variability in between each beat. If your variability is erratic and all over the place, so some beats are 
75 seconds, some beats are 95 seconds. That's usually an indication of some sort of stressor on the body. So that means the sympathetic nervous system is activated. When you go into a pattern that's called coherence, you have a very even beat. So the beats are 79, 80, 81, like within a very tight range. That means you're in a coherence pattern. And when you're in a coherence pattern, that usually means that you're in a parasympathetic state. So a couple of things that people can do, they can you know, put this device at their desk at work and they can just plug it in for three to five minutes, get themselves into a parasympathetic state and kind of do an honest self-assessment of how they feel. And the machine will give them instant neurofeedback or the app on their phone will give them instant neurofeedback so they can see how they're responding. Now you have instant neurofeedback, so you can also entertain thoughts. You can think about certain things, certain ideas, certain concepts, certain projects, certain people. And if your heart rate variability starts changing, then you start to get an indication of what your body likes and what it doesn't like. So it's the closest thing that you can do to talking to your subconscious mind is using the heart rate variability and that neurofeedback to really tell you what your body likes and what it doesn't like and who it likes and who it doesn't like. So it's kind of interesting, actually, uh, how you can use that. You can use it very clinically or you can kind of use it spiritually as well, because when things are misaligned, you know, we call it a gut feeling. But when things are misaligned emotionally, then it'll show up in our body and it'll show up in the heart rate variability as well. Marnie and I actually have the hardware. I got it for her for her birthday, I think, what, two, three years ago. And to be honest, I've used it on and off over time, but I've never really stuck with it. And when I get done using it, I'll use it for maybe five or 10 minutes at a time and I'll get in coherence, like you said. I don't know if I'm getting anything lasting out of doing the practice. So is there something I should be aiming for when I'm doing it? Obviously, you want to be in coherence, but how can I step it up and really get the most out of that time? Well, consistency is important, but here's what I think. I think it's a great tool to create awareness. You don't have to use it every single day. You're probably unique in the sense that you probably don't have the same stressors that some of our clients might you're a pretty cool, relaxed guy, unless I'm missing something. So you probably have like pretty calm, relaxing physiology. And that's how I am. I'm like generally quite calm. Like it takes a lot to get me worked up. For me, I find it very easy to get into a coherence pattern. My wife, on the other hand, finds it a little bit more challenging because she's wired a little bit differently. But what we did with her in realizing that is that just because you do heart math for five minutes, that's just a very small percentage of your day. If your subconscious programming is running in a kind of a sabotaging way, then you're only doing this for five minutes and the rest of the time you're in this perpetual stressful state. So I would dig deeper for people like that. It might be suggestive really to everyone to dig a little bit deeper to see if there's something that you can do at a subconscious level to get more out of it. But I would say that once you become kind of familiar with your body language or your HRV, you don't have to actually hook it up. So it can be like a training device for you. But if you're not very stressed out throughout the day, I mean, this is a good kind of tool for people to recenter themselves and rebalance themselves and get them to create a greater awareness of their body and how they feel when they're in a parasympathetic state. But some people kind of live in a perpetual parasympathetic state, just like there's people that live in a chronically stressed out state. There's people that live in a perpetually relaxed state too. And some of that can have to do with how you're genetically wired as well. So there are some genetic SNPs that can determine how stressed out somebody stays after a specific stressful event, for example. I want to go back to something you talked about earlier, and this relates to the thoughts that we think on a daily basis and how that impacts our health. You know, this is such a huge area and so much of what we experience day to day from chronic pain to inflammation comes back to how we show up in our world. Let's expand on this and just talk about the thoughts that we have and what this is doing to us. Well, essentially, all thoughts create a corresponding chemistry. That chemistry can either correspond with health or it can correspond with disease or illness. So our thoughts are extremely important. What we think about, who we think about, what we think about that person or that situation, the perception that we have around scenarios and circumstances is extremely, extremely important. So going back to the amygdala, you know, where the subconscious programming of fight or flight is stored, in some cases, that needs to be reprogrammed for people. And I think a lot of people, if they're not willing to do the deep work, they can at least start with the superficial work, right? So they can reframe certain people in their lives. They can reframe certain scenarios in their lives. You know, I could be an extremely negative person about all those things that happened to me. And then I can assume that everyone that I'm going to encounter is going to try to rip me off and uh, do bad things to me and take advantage of me. Or I can 
have a different perception of the situation, which is, okay, this was probably one of the most expensive lessons I learned, but it was still cheaper than chiropractic school. I can also look at it as, you know, I've learned from this. I don't do this to somebody else. So we can go through life wondering if life is happening to us, which is usually kind of the victim mentality, or we can look at it as how is life happening for us? And so that's more at a conscious level, but then I really feel like going a little bit deeper can be helpful for a lot of people. And you actually talk about how the quickest way to feel better is to change what we're thinking about. So for people who are needing something to happen right away, this is an area they probably want to look at relatively soon. Yeah, so there's different anchors that you can have. When I go on vacation, if I go to a like a destination wedding or if I'm on vacation with my son and wife or even with a, a group of friends of mine, I always have two anchors. I have a scent anchor, so I'll use an essential oil or you know something that anchors that uh, scent and experience into my limbic brain. And then I also have a song that I listen to. Whenever you're experiencing euphoria, joy, happiness, you can anchor a song or a scent into your brain. So the instant you smell that, it'll take you back there and it'll instantly change your physiology. So that could be a really, really good tip for people who go on vacation is to do something like that. And it's kind of like perfume or cologne is a really easy one. So let's say that your friend wears a specific perfume or a specific cologne and somebody walks in the mall and they're wearing the exact same perfume. It is almost impossible not to think of that person who you've already associated that scent to. There's amazing ways that you can kind of reprogram the limbic brain as well and anchor things like songs and smells. What about the people out there that are working jobs that they hate or they really dislike? I know this really impacts health in a negative way. You've talked about it before. What kind of impact is this having on somebody's well-being? Well, it's having a, a significant impact. You know, how we spend our time is how we spend our life. You know, some of the most profound clinical results we've gotten are from people who quit their jobs. I've been witness to incredible outcomes. Like I'll give you an example. I had a lady come in who had chronic persistent low back pain. You know, she came to see me as a functional medicine practitioner, but she didn't even mention her low back pain because she thought that it was a structural problem. And she would see like, you know, an acupuncturist or massage therapist or a traditional chiropractor to get it addressed. One day we addressed some of her chronic issues and then she said, you know, my back pain's not going away. On the first day, I still remember I said, Janice, you need to quit your job because that was one of the first things that she brought up as well, that her job was very stressful. And I said, you know, the goal here isn't to make you more comfortable and have normal labs while your job is killing you because then I'm actually accomplice to murder, if you will. The goal is to make the changes that are necessary that are going to help you live your best life. And she felt underappreciated. And, you know, one of her complaints was Hashimoto's. And I said, you know, that underappreciation and lack of feeling valued is going to spike your cytokines and it's going to sabotage everything that we're doing. Of course, not everyone listens the first time, but it wasn't an easy transition for her. So I don't want to discredit her for not saying she wasn't trying, but it wasn't an easy thing for her to do. Because as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people are living a certain way where they live paycheck to paycheck or they're just a couple of weeks away from not being able to make ends meet. So they kind of trap themselves financially in having to work. And so there's this stress associated with work because people might not like it, but they're not in a financial position to quit their job and then give themselves some breathing room to find something that they actually love. Instead, they're working somewhere and then they're looking for a job at the same time. And it's just like really incongruent you know, from a spiritual standpoint, like I would never want an employee working for me while they're looking for another job. You know, I always think of it from the employer's end, but also from the employee's end. And I wouldn't want somebody working for me who didn't want to work there, right? I don't think that's fair to them. And what they're costing you is more than what you're paying them is the way I look at it as an employer. So it's always in the best interest of everyone that people love what they do. So anyways, fast forward six months and she actually brings up her low back pain. She's like, you know, I've been doing this, this and this and and it hasn't really gone away. And I said, Janice, quit your job. And she did. And within a week, all of her back pain went away. So she had spent thousands of dollars trying to get this fixed. And it turns out it was her job that was causing it. And she's never been happier since. And after she quit her job, she met her now husband and her life is completely transformed. So Amazing things happen when we just kind of trust that something better is waiting for us when we give up the things that aren't serving us anymore. There's certain things that are pretty obvious when it comes to optimizing health, like for the right person, taking the right supplements and diet, exercise, these things, sleep, what we would call pillars of health. But the changing one's job, this is a little bit less obvious. So are there other things that people might not be thinking about that are a little less obvious that could be really having a great impact 
on them not being healthy? Yeah, so I would say communication. Communication is probably one of the most overlooked causes of stress. How we communicate with other people, how much stress that creates in us or in that other person. Miscommunication is a big source of stress and our inability to sometimes communicate with people who are really close to us. So our coworkers, our spouses, our children, And so I believe that there are no such thing as bad people, just bad communicators. And I know I can have a certain intention and I can say something to my wife. And if it doesn't come out quite correctly, then that creates problems. So we learned something called the DISC personality profile. And so there's four personality profiles that need to be taken into consideration. There's the D, the I, the S, and the C. And I'm a D and an I. So Ds are dominant. They're very direct. They're short to the point, kind of bottom line type of people. And so I try to say things in as few words as possible. That's why I'm really good at creating memes because that's just a skill that I have. And then eyes are people who are people pleasers. And sometimes these are people who are people pleasers to their own detriment. Eyes are people who you generally, they're the social butterflies, awesome people, great front desk employees, if you will, not good at being accountants because that's not their thing. And so eyes like to be communicated. They're usually high energy people. So you've got to match their energy. If you're communicating with a D, you've got to be direct and bottom line. S's make up the majority of the population. And the majority of patients that we see are S's. S's are people who like steadiness, stability, support. These are people who are extremely loyal. They show up early to a job they hate, right? They never miss a day. So they're almost you know, loyal to a fault. And then you have C's. These are people who are competent. So they're people who do a lot of research. They ask a lot of questions. They like to have an understanding of process. And these people basically are the people you call if you need to buy a new phone or a new computer, you call this person up because they've been doing months and months of research before they buy anything. So they usually have the nice stuff, but they're paralyzed by decision-making. These people like to understand process. So when you're communicating, when you understand there are different communication styles and not everyone wants to be communicated to the way you want to be communicated to, then you have profound shifts in people's relationships. So now things don't get taken the wrong way. If I give a one word answer, as long as I answered your question, it doesn't matter if I add additional words on the back end of it. What can at one point be uh, seen as being rude, for example, is now seen as being that person's communication style and the expectations of the response change as well. Now, the reason communication is very important is because communication is the highest faculty of the human being. What makes us unique is our ability to communicate. And we generally communicate in a very confusing and semantically you know, broken language. So English is one of the worst languages for communication because the word there can mean three different things and it's spelled three different ways, right? The word by can mean three different things and it's spelled three different ways. So Communication in the English language can be very confusing. So how we communicate is extremely important because as is the macrocosm, so is the microcosm. And our body is in a constant state of communicating with itself. So it communicates with itself through hormonal signaling and by glands secreting hormones and neurotransmitters, for example, to then create a corresponding physiology. And, you know, when we can get people's relationships to get better and we can get people to eliminate the challenges that are encountered by this amazing skill that human beings have, which is communication, then amazing changes start happening with these individuals. It's actually part of our intake form. So when we have a patient come in, the most important page is the communication style because I need to know what words I need to use, you know, how I can effectively communicate my message to this individual. I need to know what to expect when they're communicating with me. I need to know, you know, what type of information is going to help move this person to making a, a decision that's beneficial to them. You know, if I don't communicate effectively to this individual, then I lose them. And guess what? If I lose them, then they lose because now they're not going to experience the best health that they can possibly experience. We're going to take another quick break from the show with Sachin to give a shout out to our show sponsor, Thrive Market. Online shopping is the way of the future and it's what everyone is doing these days and Thrive Market makes it that much better and that much easier. What's so incredible about Thrive Market is that you can shop online by all your favorite health food categories, whether that's paleo, grain-free, superfoods, and you're going to find pages and pages of products that fit within your paradigm. You can just load up your cart and order them right to your door. The other awesome thing about Thrive Market is that for every membership that's purchased, they give another membership to a family in need, making healthy eating affordable and accessible to everybody. Such an incredible mission. And as a listener of our show, 
you're getting 25% off your order. And that's in addition to the 20 to 50% off the products that are listed on the website. So you're getting an awesome deal right there. And you're also going to get a free 30-day trial and free shipping. All of that because you are a listener of our show. And to take advantage of your amazing listener discount, it's super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash thrive market. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash thrive market. Amazing company, great products. Hit pause, go and take advantage of your deal right now. And now I'm going to share an iTunes review with you guys. This one is by It's Brit May, a five-star review titled Podcast Virgin. And this person writes, I'm rather new to podcasts and never really knew what they were about. I commute an hour to work every day and was getting really tired of the same music playlist on my journey. I asked for some recommendations of podcasts and this one really stuck out to me. It's the first and only podcast I listen to regularly and have suggested it to several friends. I've learned so much from their guests and have implemented a lot of their suggestions into my everyday life. It's so easy to listen to, and I always can't wait to see what's coming out next. Thank you so much for these kind words. We really appreciate it. For everybody that's taken the time to leave a review, Marty and I read each and every one. We really, really appreciate it, guys. Thank you for taking the time to do so. And if you haven't left us a review yet, make sure that you go ahead and do so right now. UltimateHealthPodcast.com slash iTunes. We love each and every one of them. Thank you guys so much. And now back to our show with Sachin. I can only imagine that nonverbal communication is also as critically important, especially in personal relationships. I don't think it would work so well in an office where you're just going off intuition and, and eye glances. But with someone at home, is this something that you've looked into as well? Just the communication between people without speaking. And I know you're big on body language and hugs and, and all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about that and the role in health. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. I wasn't expecting that, but I like that. You're, I like the way you're thinking. So I'll give you an example with my wife. The first language is actually our frequency. So when a child is born, for example, they can barely see. So they can't always role model what we're doing but they can feel our energy. So kind of getting spiritual woo-woo here maybe for some people, but we all have a frequency that we vibrate at and our emotions are part of that frequency. So my wife, for example, would try to put my son to sleep and he would never fall asleep. He'd have a very hard time falling asleep with her because she would be in bed wondering about all the stuff that she has to do when my son is finally dozes off. So she would have kind of a communication mismatch. So On the outside world, she's telling him go to sleep, but on the inside and how her body is uh, basically uh, chemically creating a response and frequency is that of stress and anxiety, if you will, or not certainly not sleep. And then I would put my son to sleep and I would just fall asleep and we would both fall asleep together. And and she's like, how'd you do that? I'm like, it's because I'm not thinking about not sleeping. All I'm thinking about is sleeping. And so I vibrate at that frequency and he then resonates at a corresponding frequency. The other language is nonverbal. So once we kind of get past that, then we have to be very conscious that our verbal communication and our energetic communication and our body language all correspond with each other. So sometimes parents, and this happens at a very young age, children are much more perceptive to this. They can't necessarily communicate back to us what they're feeling because they may not be able to speak just yet, but they're very receptive. Their antennas are very receptive to this. If you tell a child not to do something, but you're doing it yourself, there's an energetic and verbal mismatch. If you tell someone not to do something while you're doing it, right? So if you're telling someone, hey, don't smoke while you're smoking, then there's a visual mismatch. So human beings are are really, really good. We have something called mirror neurons. We're really, really good at mirroring somebody's physical, their facial language, their body language. And what happens is if we were to have a fake body language, if you will, or a non-corresponding signal, we're really sending other people around us a mixed message. So I hope that all makes sense. There's just misalignment in what we're saying, how we're physically behaving, and then what actually we're thinking and the frequency that we're vibrating at. So communication has to be congruent at all three of those levels. Now that makes perfect sense. And I think a lot of people just aren't necessarily aware, just like your wife, you know, she's lying there thinking, I don't get it. I'm, I'm trying to tell him to go to sleep. But until you kind of step back and realize that energetically, like, what is she feeling? What's going on in that moment? As a result of talking about this, hopefully people really start to pay attention to, are they aligning what they're saying or what they're doing 
with what they're believing. So thank you for that. Sachin, last time we were together relatively recently, we were at uh, Jen Pike's women's wellness event. And you were telling me about a new diet you were experimenting with at the time that was a really high fruit diet. Is this something you're still playing with? What have the results been so far? Last night was eight weeks. So I've maintained what I call the low protein, high antioxidant diet. Just to give people some background, I'm for the most part vegetarian. So like 98% of my diet is plant-based. And then there's a small percentage and occasional intake of animal protein, but very, very small amount. And that's just part of it is cultural and religious. So there's that component to it. And then you know, some of it's spiritual as well. And there's nothing wrong with either way. So I don't judge anyone. This is my personal belief. But recently I came across this idea of a high fruit, low protein diet. And protein is essentially the only thing our immune system can react to. So the immune system can't react to fats. It can't react to carbohydrates. It can only react to proteins. And there's a huge prevalence of autoimmunity going on. And the idea that most people have when they're vegans or vegetarians is this misconception that we need lots and lots of protein. So what do vegetarians do? They eat a lot of legumes, nuts, seeds, beans, things that can be problematic for digestion and things that can irritate the gut lining. So then when somebody says, hey, I'm vegetarian or vegan, and they get blood work done and they have all these nutrient deficiencies, is it because they're vegetarian or vegan or is it because they're eating foods that are difficult to digest because they're trying to overcompensate and get tons and tons of protein? What I discovered is that diet and digestion is really about efficiency. And so you're not what you eat, you are what you digest and absorb. And foods, no matter how healthy or organic they are, if they're not digested properly, they create basically a toxic sludge in your body. So think about foods and how they smell when they rot. So proteins usually have a very strong odor. Like if you ever leave a protein shake in your gym bag for a couple of days, like it stinks when you open it up. If you were to leave a vegetable smoothie or a fruit smoothie, it would probably have a fermented odor, but it wouldn't stink like a protein shake because proteins putrefy. And so one of the most difficult types of macros to digest are actually proteins. Proteins require a lot of energy for them to be digested because of the production of stomach acid that's required. And some people don't produce a corresponding amount of stomach acid to digest the amount of protein they're consuming. So what we did is essentially started supplementing with amino acids as a hedge against the uh, lack of proteins, if you will. But proteins are a source of amino acids, and that's all they are, because you can't use the protein for anything else except to break it down and then absorb the amino acids from it. If a protein gets into your bloodstream, then that's what triggers an autoimmune response. So for people with autoimmunity, the most profound and effective things they can do is cut out the protein, so now there's nothing to react to. Now, one way to cut out protein in all macros is by fasting. This is why people feel good when they fast. You can also do like a maple syrup fast, so you can do maple syrup, green tea, and lemon, and that basically is a no-protein fast, but it gives you enough glucose that you can push through, and it's easy to get through three to five days of it. And then, you know, you can do intermittent fasting. Again, this ensures that things are moving through your digestive tract. As long as you're getting enough amino acids from your plants, you're getting enough of the quote-unquote protein, if you will, and then you're getting lots and lots of antioxidants, you're getting lots of different types of fiber, and fiber is what feeds our gut microbiome, and we know that our gut microbiome is super important to our health. It feeds off of these healthy fibers. The variety of the fibers that we consume from all different fruits and vegetables determines the variety of our microbiome portfolio, if you will, so we want to have a well-rounded microbiome portfolio, the more resilient we are as a result of having a broad spectrum portfolio of microbes in our gut. So I'm still maintaining it. I've eaten more fruit in the last eight weeks than I have in probably five years because I think there's been this irrational fear of fruit because we're so concerned about uh, fructose. And people mistake fructose with high fructose corn syrup, and they're kind of two different things. You know, when you eat fruit, it comes with fiber, it comes with antioxidants, it comes with minerals, it comes with electrolytes, like the full package. But when you have high fructose corn syrup, there's nothing else with it. It's just garbage, usually, that it's in. So you're starting off with a, an ingredient that could, in isolation, be problematic, but then you're coupling it with other toxic ingredients. So, of course, like soda is going to be terrible for you. But we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So we can't say that the fructose in corn syrup is the same as the fructose 
in, let's say, a watermelon or a banana or, you know, another piece of fruit. Now, here's the thing with fructose. Because it's a very simple sugar, it's instantly metabolized. It requires virtually no digestion. So it instantly gets metabolized in the liver. Specifically, there is no corresponding increase in pancreatic enzymes, which means there's no energy expenditure there uh, because no energy is required to digest it. There's energy required to move it through, but that's about it. And then there's a corresponding increase in uh, blood sugar, obviously, because it's instantly metabolized. So one thing to keep in mind is that when we consume complex carbohydrates, the reason they keep our blood sugar stable is because they take longer to digest. You know, to say that it takes longer to digest and that's why it's good for us, we can look at it two ways. If I'm eating something, do I want that energy now when I'm eating or do I want it five hours from now and put all the stress on my digestive organs to actually break all this stuff down? And proteins and fats are the same way. These are very nutrient-dense foods and very biologically and biochemically complex foods. And the reason they sit in our stomach longer and stimulate our stress receptors and keep us full is because they take longer to digest. And if something takes longer to digest, it means it takes more energy to digest it. So if I were to eat 1,000 calories of plants versus 1,000 calories of a high-protein meal and a high-fat meal, well, which one is going to yield a higher net caloric result? If the protein and the fat, high fat and high protein meal takes an extra 300 calories just to digest it, people might say, oh, well, eating a high fat, high protein diet increases metabolism. Well, yeah, you're increasing metabolism not for the right reasons, right? You're not increasing that metabolism and using it to heal. You're increasing metabolism to digest your food. So if you can find a more efficient source like plants that are already kind of pre-digested, that come with their own enzymes, that come with minerals and vitamins and fibers, then you're going to get an instant increase in your energy. And what that means is you just have to have a different strategy in terms of how you're going to consume your calories throughout the day. So this idea that we have that you have to eat you know, breakfast at eight o'clock and then you have to eat something that fills you up for four hours because it takes you four hours to digest it, that's not necessarily to me the most efficient way to get unwell people healthy because people who are unwell typically have compromised digestive function and you're adding a lot of stress on their digestive organs. So maybe for some people going more plant-based and then working their way up to you know a 10 to 15% animal protein diet could be beneficial and then they can kind of adjust accordingly. But increasing metabolism for the sake of increasing metabolism is to me doesn't make sense. And I know there's a lot of studies that kind of talk about this that we found that when this person ate this many calories and we paired them against somebody who ate the same number of calories, they had increased metabolism. Well, you know what? The person that ate the high plant diet probably could have sufficed with eating less calories because the net caloric result would have been higher for that person. So we have to start thinking about food, in my opinion, a little bit differently. We have to think of it in a more layered way instead of kind of in a linear way, which is how food is presented these days. It's all about the macros. It's all about you know the calories. But you know, how many calories are you using or expending to incorporate those calories into your body? And for me, it's about efficiency. So as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, I want to be efficient with how I spend my money. And so my body, I want to be efficient with how I spend my calories. And Sachin, another topic we had a chance to dig into a little bit together was talking about different lighting, specifically before bed that we have we recently had Dave Asprey on the show and we've made some switches I was telling you about in our house where we're now using a lot of red LED bulbs. I know you made some switches as well. I think you're using like a yellow or... Yeah, so we have a 2700 Kelvin LED bulbs. We've got a young son, so it's hard to like go all out, but I wear the true dark glasses. So I wear the red ones. I'm a lion. I don't know if you're familiar with the chronotypes, but I'm usually up really early and then I kind of go to bed early. So for me, like I'm not trying to stay up at night. I'm not trying to get on the computer at night or on the iPhone or anything like that. I usually just chill. And if I want to watch TV, I'll watch like, you know, Shark Tank or Dragon's Den or something, but I'll have my glasses on. And then I'm usually in bed by 9 30, 10 o'clock. Yeah, we've actually had the sleep doctor on the show. So our listeners should be familiar with the different chronotypes. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Why would somebody want to make some of these lighting switches and where would somebody begin? Well, the reason to make these lighting switches is because it influences the most important aspect of your healing, which is sleep. So if we think about the best way to heal, if somebody were asked me, what are the best things I can do to heal and heal as quickly as possible? I would say do nothing. And what I mean by that is I would tell them to sleep more because that's probably one thing that they need. I would tell them to sit in silence more because that's probably what they need emotionally. And I would tell them not to eat anything for three days if they can. So fasting. So doing nothing is actually the most 
profound way to shift your health in the shortest period of time. Of course, that's not realistic for everyone, but you know, since we're talking about sleep, sleep is your most important healing tool. And you know, that's why we prioritize sleep. If somebody's not sleeping, they're not healing. And if they're not healing, they're not getting results. And everything else you're doing is essentially managing bad sleep and bad healing patterns. Sleep is important for the immune system. It's when our body heals and repairs. And so imagine trying to get a mechanic to work on your car while you're driving it, right? It just doesn't work that way. So the body heals and repairs while we're sleeping. The brain actually, interestingly enough, the brain actually shrinks and then it kind of cleans itself out while we're sleeping and then it kind of expands back up again. So the size of the sulcuses and gyri in our brain change while we're sleeping. So there's an important things that happen in the brain for healing to take place. And sleeping is probably one of the most parasympathetic things that you can do. So it's important that we get into that nightly state of being parasympathetic so that our body can heal and regenerate itself. And sleep, you know, spills into other areas. So if somebody has low energy, you know, we don't want to give them caffeine or we don't want to give them even supplements that help increase energy. Chances are they're not sleeping well. And, and just an important question to kind of throw out there, you know, we'll find clients say this and you might find this too, is when we ask people, how is your sleep? Their response will be, oh, my sleep is great. And then we'll ask them the second layer to that question, which is, how do you feel when you wake up? Oh, I feel terrible when I wake up. I'm tired, I'm groggy, I'm foggy, I'm stiff. Well, your sleep probably sucks then. So you have to ask that second question. So you can even skip the first question and say, how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? And then kind of work backwards from there. But sleep is, is just super critical. It's super easy. I mean, what's easier than closing your eyes and going to bed? Thinking about the things that impact our sleep, stress impacts our sleep, relationships impact our sleep, work can impact our sleep in a positive and negative way. You know, if you've got a big promotion coming up and you, you're interviewing with the boss tomorrow, I mean, that can keep us up and keep us anxious. Uh, certain foods, foods that have caffeine in them can stimulate us and keep us up at night. So if you're going to prioritize anything on your journey, prioritize your sleep. And one of my hacks personally is my son loves when I put him to sleep. And so three to four nights out of the week, I'll put him to bed and I'll just crash with him at 8.30. So that gives me an extra couple of hours. And I find that when I do that, I wake up earlier, I wake up more refreshed and I get a three hour head start on everyone else because I'm up at five and you know he wakes up around 7.30, 8-ish. So I'm able to you know get some work done and, and be much more productive. So Sachin, other than getting to bed early on those nights, you have your true dark glasses, you've made some switches of different light bulbs, so you're not impacting your melatonin production. What are some of the other things you're doing to wind down at the end of the day to have a even better sleep? Sure. So I use a pulse electromagnetic field mat on my bed. It basically increases microcirculation throughout your body, so it promotes like systemic healing throughout the body. So I lay on that for 20 minutes. It's a passive therapy, and I usually fall asleep within five to 10 minutes, so the mat runs its cycle for 20 minutes. I do that first thing in the morning, and I do it right before I go to bed. The other thing that we do is uh, essential oils. So sometimes we'll diffuse essential oils in the room, like lavender, or specifically we use a brand called doTERRA, and the specific oil is called Serenity. So that helps with kind of relaxing the body and getting us into more restful sleep. And you know, just shout out to Dave Asprey, one of the things that I've been doing recently that I found has helped is I've been taking sleep mode. So that's liposomal melatonin, and there's a few other things in there that help promote deeper relaxation. And I found that for me, that's made a bigger difference because I used to wake up around two and I'd, I'd be able to fall back asleep, no problem. But now I'm sleeping completely through the night, which is very welcome for me. Ah, I am one to wake up at three, four and not be able to get back to sleep. So that might be something I need. <laughs> yeah, try it out. All right, Sachin. So as we're wrapping up on time, something we like to do is ask a few questions just to get to know you a little bit better. Sound good? Absolutely. All right. First question. What are three things that you're most grateful for? Oh, easy. <laughs> my wife, my son, my parents, and uh, my team members and my practice. Those are the things that show up most often in my uh, gratitude journal every day. What is the biggest misconception people have about you? Oh, wow. <laughs> I would say people are intimidated by me because I'm very direct and to the point. Again, back, going back to communication styles, I don't mean anything offensive. I just say what needs to be said. And people who don't know communication styles can sometimes find that intimidating. So I've been told that I'm intimidating, but you guys know me. I'm, I try, I'm a pretty calm, collected guy. Very down to earth. <laughs> so what is 180 you have taken in your health routine over the years? You know, probably the biggest 180 for me is cutting out gluten. That was a big part of my diet growing up. 
you know, for breakfast, we'd have cereal. For lunch, I had a peanut butter sandwich. My friends used to make fun of me. I had a peanut butter sandwich every day, like throughout my entire life. And then for dinner, we would have, you know, flatbread and vegetables. But I was tested by four different labs because I was in denial about, you know, having to cut out gluten from my life because it was just such a staple in a ve- Indian vegetarian diet. And uh, you didn't have many options because anytime you would have the vegetables, there'd have to be some sort of corresponding, you know, delivery agent uh, being the flatbread in this case. Or, um, you know, if you had a sandwich, well, back in the day, we didn't have gluten-free. We didn't even know about gluten-free, but you would be eating all this wheat. So for me, that was the biggest thing that I've found in terms of impact on my health. What are you most excited about right now? Great question. So the thing I'm most excited about is our living proof vision. And I just see an amazing opportunity for, you know, this vitalistic form of healthcare to come out and and really impact a lot of lives. I'm excited for, you know, the technology that exists that allows us to, you know, do podcasts like this and, and reach, you know, hundreds, thousands, eventually millions of people with a message of self empowerment and self care. You know, I'm really stoked at the possibility of franchising our business because I know that it'll help a lot of people, you know, feel their best again. What is your favorite snack on the go? My favorite snack is roasted seaweed. All right. Is there a certain brand you like? We just buy the big one, the bulk package from Costco. I demolish that stuff. So the brand that we get is actually the Kirkland brand. Okay, nice. So Sachin, you dropped so much knowledge on this interview, so many things for our listeners to take away, apply to their healthy routine. But what is one takeaway the listeners can apply right away, right after they're done listening into their healthy routine? I think the one thing that everything starts with is pursuing happiness and trusting your body. If you can do those two things, it's a big shift in somebody's paradigm, you know, because we're convinced that our body is broken and it doesn't know what it's doing and it's unintelligent. That's kind of the, the entire message of our marketing system for the allopathic system. Not to say that everyone believes that, but that's how it's marketed. And the other thing is, you know, what you truly believe determines the decisions that you make. So if you truly believe your body can heal and you trust that it can heal, then you will change your diet. You will change your perception. You will change your relationships. You will quit your job if you believe that it's killing you, right? So until we deeply, truly believe, we don't really change our behavior. So there has to be a deep belief. And sometimes that has to occur at a subconscious level because our belief system is broken and that belief system is formed between the age of zero and seven. So it's really not our fault as adults if we have broken patterns and they come from a time in our lives where We had no control and chances are our parents didn't have podcasts like this to listen to, to become even conscious of the impact that the words that they use, the actions that they take, the ways they express themselves, they probably had no idea how this would impact us as adults. So much great information, Sachin. You know, this is awesome. And we're so excited, you know, for our listeners to take in all this info. And guys, you can find out all the show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And Sachin, how else can our listeners get in touch with you? The best thing that people can do, we've created a program, it's called 30 Ways in 30 Days. And I like people to start there. Our mission is to keep people out of our practice. And I share my 30 best tips. I send you a short little video clip and an email every day. I take you through my home and I show you the actual products and uh, things that we use in our home to try to keep us healthy and and happy. And uh, it's just our way of introducing you to a wellness lifestyle. And also if people pick up like anywhere from one to 30 things that they do for the rest of their life, their life is gonna move in the right direction. So the website is www.30in30.org. So 30in30.org, and they can just put their name and email address in and they'll instantly get a cookbook from me and they'll start getting some awesome tips on a daily basis uh, sent out to them. All right, Sachin, we're going to link that up in the show notes. Again, ultimatehealthpodcast.com. I just want to thank you so much for your time. This interview, we just got into so many different things and went really deep and I'm sure there's definitely a round two we're going to have to have down the line because honestly, we could just keep chatting with you. So just thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And and thank you both for the wonderful work that you're also doing and and, uh, for the platform to share this information with the rest of the world. So I thank you guys and I love you guys. Yeah, it was our pleasure. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed this amazing conversation with Dr. Sachin Patel. If you enjoyed this podcast as much as we did, share it with someone in your life. It could be a friend, a colleague, a parent, someone that you know will enjoy this podcast or any of our previous podcasts. Share it, spread the love. This is going to help our show grow and we'll so appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for helping spread the word. 
And I want to give a shout out to our engineer and editor, Jason Sanderson at podcasttech.com. He does such a great job putting our episodes together. Thank you. And just want to say, have a fantastic week, you guys. We'll talk soon. Take care.